Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is developer and real estate investment expert Michael Tillman. Michael is the CEO of PTM Partners, a real estate investment and development firm focused on qualified opportunity zones. Now, the team has collectively invested, developed, constructed, and managed more than $12 billion in real estate, covering a broad range of mixed-use projects in Florida, New Jersey, New York, and D.C. Now, by purchasing land intelligently and designing efficiently sized units with a variety of hotel quality amenities and services, PTM has been able to deliver price-accessible luxury housing. The principals of PTM have collectively executed over $8 billion worth of construction projects and over $20 billion in real estate transactions. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome my guest for today's show, Michael Tillman. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm all right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to have you here and excited to learn more about you and uh, and PTM and uh, just the, the story. So maybe let's back up a little bit. You know, I gave you the introduction there, uh, somewhat Somewhat just uh, high level. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to your story. So how about let, let's start with uh, your background, Michael. For those that aren't familiar with you that are tuning in that, that haven't heard of you, haven't heard of even PTM, but maybe let's back up be before PTM, kind of what's your backstory and how did you get involved in real estate? Sure. Um, so getting involved in real estate, I've always loved real estate, right? I was a Lego uh, freak as a kid, but um it, Post college was uh, was an accountant for two years and one day, and uh, got my CPA license and uh, buzzed out. Knew it wasn't for me, and uh, had a unique opportunity to work with a uh, real estate private equity fund that focused on Asia uh, in two thousand four, called Atos Capital, and was there for about seven years, uh, doing first accounting and then uh, transitioned over to acquisitions and investment. And went back, got my MBA, and then was very fortunate to work for the Lefrak family, uh, which Richard, Richard Lefrak and his two sons, uh, one of the largest private development firms in the country based in New York, and just had a tremendous learning experience as to how you actually build these things, right? Because a lot of folks nowadays, there's a whole class of private equity real estate investors who know an awful lot about how to make things solve to a 20% IRR but couldn't tell you the first thing about how you actually build the building. <laughs> and I saw that there was a, a real unique competitive advantage if I could actually learn that side of the business. Mm -hmm. And Richard took me under his wing and I had the great fortune to build out their platform down here in South Florida uh, between 2010 and 2018, where we did some really amazing projects, the One Hotel South Beach, um, which is now one of the top hotels in the country. And then uh, a large mixed use master development called Sole Mia, 185 acre former EPA Superfund site that'll be developed into 5,000 residential units and a million and a half square feet of commercial um, just in North Miami, right, right by the water. And, and that site found itself in an opportunity zone. And from there, um, the, the, sprinkling of an idea of what PTM could be was born and fast forward six years. And, and here we are. All righty. No, that, that's great. I appreciate the background. So just, uh, you know, curious as to, you know, starting as a, as an accountant, CPA doing accounting, was it ASOS? Is that, was that the, the name of the firm? ATOS. Yep. A a ATOS. Talk to me about the, the, the pivot from, you know, working on the finance accounting side to acquisitions. What did that, what did that pivotal change look like within the organization? Was it easy, easy to adapt to, or, I mean, talk to me about just the general scope of and expectations of moving over to that new role. I mean, it was a lot of hard work and then a stroke of good fortune. <laughs> right. So uh, I came on board two years and a day out of school. I was a CPA by trade. I was booking journal entries on Excel and helping build financial statements, correct the general ledger, et cetera, et cetera. And this was now 2003, 2004, 2005. The market was going vertical, right? Um, for those of us that remember the pre great financial crisis, right? right. And uh, especially then you had the the BRIC countries, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, that were absolutely on a tear. And ATOS had gotten its start focusing in on Japan during the uh, NPL crisis there, right? The founders of ATOS were all ex-Mesra folks, which was uh, a big Japanese investor, you know, out of Morgan Stanley. Um, 
they wanted to start a new business platform that was focused on investing in real estate and real estate related public securities in 13 countries across Asia. And I, in all candor, was there working late and had the good fortune of walking by a conference room when they were talking through who's going to do all this work, um, preparing analyses, et cetera. And uh, they called me in, asked me what my uh, my day job was and if I'd like to take <laughs> on a, a second gig. So um, I had a steep learning curve with a great mentor in uh, Jim Alwyn and Scott Kelly and Mary Clark. And all, all very ex senior people at Morgan Stanley. And from nine to five, I was an accountant booking journal entries. And from 501 till about 201 AM every day for the oh, next man. year, I was learning securities analysis and uh, working with the Bloomberg and helping build shadow portfolios and putting together pitch books and marketing decks. And that ultimately turned into a, uh, a long short hedge fund focused on those um, real estate and real estate related securities in Asia. That's exciting, man. Like, I feel like that's a whole show in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Like there, there's a lot more there that we could probably dive down the rabbit hole into. I mean, wow. I, I just, uh, at least a, a vault of, uh, uh, probably memory, good memories for you, right? Just uh, but a, a time where, I mean, it sounds like you dedicated every, every ounce of, uh, additional time outside of your nine to five and, and sleeping to, uh, to learning this new, this new role and uh and obviously excelling in it so that's that's fantastic i appreciate you sharing that um we'd love to talk about you know the gfc and, and you know really it sounds like you was it 2010 when you hopped on um with the new group was with left rack yes yeah, with left rack in with, 2010 with so obviously yeah. that's you, you made a comment in the beginning you know there's lots of lots of different groups pe firms out there that can you know theoretically and on paper you know you know make things pencil out to a 20 percent plus irr but actually saying it and doing it are two two different things talk to me about i guess um uh, let's start here just i guess first and foremost what the, you know let's expand upon that a little bit of, of what that really means and maybe some of the um, you know, of what you learn, like the golden, golden nuggets that you learn with left rack uh, of actually how to do it, the mechanics of how to do it, not just to how to, you know, make the pro forma say that that's going to happen. Sure. Um, and this could be its own, uh, multi-session discussion, but, sure. you know, Richard left rack used to say a lot, um, anyone can call themselves a developer, but not everyone can call themselves a builder. Right. And, you know, to be a developer, you have to be able to be fluent in a lot of different parts of the trade. And what's happened over the last, I'd say, decade and a half, maybe a little longer, was given the low interest rates, given the availability of capital, a whole new breed of developer was created called Merchant Builder, mm -hmm. right? That that class of developer wasn't really uh, as, as, as big and as profound as it is today. Right, because if you think back to the fifties, sixties, seventies, I mean, most developers were were names. You knew who these families were, and they had one universal constant amongst them, which was they held their real estate forever. Mm -hmm. um, these merchant builders, right, with with real estate becoming an institutional investment class in private equity and 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 alternatives, the IRR calculation started getting applied to real estate and real estate development. And historically, real estate and development has really been a equity multiple and whole dollar profit kind of calculation, right? So now you had guys who would source land, design, build, lease up, stabilize, exit, all in a span of three to five years. Mm -hmm. And yes, they would get tremendous IRRs, but the multiple on their deal would end up being, you know, maybe it was a 1.7, a 1.8, a 2x, right? Which if you really step back and think about it, that was never, or not never, that was not historically how real estate development was categorized, right? So what, what I learned at LeftRack was truly a few things. One, <clears throat> real estate is all about basis, right? So for us, it's all about what we pay for what we're getting and then capitalizing that in a, very conservative manner, right? At LeftRack, it was all the family's money. They were not playing with other people's money. Mm -hmm. Leverage was used to optimize. Leverage was not used to necessarily make a deal work, right? And if a deal can work with no leverage, great, all the better, 
Um, and that's a practice that we've carried over to PTM and why for us, the opportunity zones were such a natural landing point because the next lesson was you hold your real estate for as long as possible, right? As, as Richard used to say to me, you know, it's really good when you can say no, yeah. right? And, and that to, to us is really profound in the opportunity zone, because if you think about it from an OZ standpoint, you have all these merchant builders out there who are building and, and flipping in three to five years, making a good IRR, which is good for their promoted interest in waterfall, but it's not maximizing the dollars for the investor. Right. Yep. And certainly from an opportunity zone standpoint, it's the, the real benefit to you is, is the amount of dollars that are not taxable. Mm -hmm. at the end of that 10 years, right? So it was just a very natural progression for us to come out of doing development for a long-term builder, holder, investor, developer, to then be focusing in on opportunity zones where we're focusing in on equity multiple and whole dollar profit over the long term. Yeah, no, and I'm, I definitely want to I want to go down that path and learn a little bit more about your your specific business model as it relates to uh, to OZ zone uh, opportunity zones. Um, but one uh, I had a couple more questions about when you um, when when you when you pivoted over and went with Left Rack in 2010. Obviously, that was that was you know post GFC, but still you know you, you mentioned opening up the new platform in South Florida. Um, you know, Florida in general, South Florida, you know, Tampa Bay, Jacksonville. I mean, Florida was ground zero amongst a few other um, markets throughout the country, you know, for the, you know, GFC. I mean, lots of distressed real estate, lots of, um, you know, excess projects that either got out of the ground, never got out of the ground, just lots of excess inventory across the board and in a litany of different asset classes. So we'd love to, you know, you jumping in and starting out this new platform for left rack, what did that look like? I mean, and, and that, and that day and age, 2010, 2011, again, still lots of distress, lots of pain happening in the market, especially, especially in Florida and South Florida. Um, talking about some of those challenges, uh, you know, where you guys, how are you able to identify, navigate opportunity, even amongst um, all the craziness that was happening at that point in time? It's a great question. So we were, we had a front row seat for all of this. Um, one of the first large transactions I had the you know, pleasure to work on with the Left Racks was a uh, acquisition of Chorus Bank, which you may recall was one of the first banks to fail during the GFC. It was actually the first good bank, bad bank deal that the FDIC was doing, right? When they were taking the failed banks and they were taking the bad loan portfolio, moving that to the side, and then selling the good bank right outside of it. And you had private equity and groups coming in and buying that bad loan portfolio. So in a joint venture with Starwood Capital, TPG, Perry Capital, and Invesco, Lefrak ended up buying uh, this bad loan portfolio from Chorus. And the JV became the largest owner of unsold condos in Florida in 2010. Wow. Right. So this is when you're seeing the journal issuing uh, you know, headlines, 19 years of excess supply in Miami, right? In the condo market. Um, and the movie, The Big Short, right? All these people are talking about, I own six condos, I own 12 condos. And a lot of them were in Miami. Um, <laughs> yep. Now, of course, his portfolio wasn't just Miami centric, but they, they had a very large exposure there. And so we worked and created a, uh, a platform down there called um, ST Residential. And they oversaw and managed all of these uh, broken condos, right? And worked on <clears throat> repositioning the, the assets and, and getting the units sold. And the observation that we had, right, sitting there in the front row was that all of these South American investors were coming into the country and buying these units all cash. Now that is now universally understood. Everyone thinks of Florida condos as South American vaults for their cash. But in 2010, 2011, that was not how anyone understood Miami. Um, and, and so we were seeing that you would, you would raise the prices and they would move faster. And um, that was when um, we realized that at Lefrak that there could be a, a larger opportunity here for the family. And after uh, you know another year of due diligence, the family made the decision to 
uh, expand beyond the tri-state and into that market. And uh, they've done a tremendous job over the past decade down here. I'm just curious of the, what additional intel um, did, did you guys have to, again, using the the data point um, of 19 years of excess inventory, right? So, I mean, that's a quite a long um, term of absorption of, of vacant units, right? And uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that your your underwriting didn't assume 19 years, and so I guess what what additional intel um, were you guys basing it on, and and, w- and what did that intel tell you? I mean that that ultimately we can we can buy these and, and we could probably get these all absorbed in in six or seven years, you know, four to five years. How did it differ from what you know the headlines were reading? Sure, um, what we saw was the absorption pace was just you know three to four x what we thought it was going to be, hmm. you know. And, and ultimately, when I say we, the JV was the largest owner of unsold condos in South Florida, it was approximately 3,000 condos. And mm. it took approximately four years for that condo portfolio to sell off. Um, and, and that was as prices were being pushed up steadily over time. So um, again, sitting right at the front row, being able to see actual sales data mm. and, and the volume that things were moving. Um, and then from there, right, naturally spending more time on the ground, speaking with others, because the truth is this, the local developers, they were more than aware of what was happening. And, you know, for a lot of them, just like a lot of people who made those bets, right, on on CLOs and CBOs and CMBS, mm-hmm. their bets weren't wrong. They just couldn't hold them long enough for them to be right. Um, and it was the same thing with a lot of these developers. Their, their bets were right. Um, just the market whipsawed them. Um, and, and, and the time didn't work. Yeah. Very interesting. No, that's great. I appreciate you sharing that. So talk about PTM today. I mean, your business model, you, you, t- you took a lot of, of knowledge that, that you gained uh, with left rack and, 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 and your prior experiences and basically, you know, got together with a few other folks and, uh, and, and, and formed PTM. So let's talk about your specific business model, kind of like your unique selling proposition to the marketplace. What is it that you guys do and what you do? Great. Sure. So myself and uh, two former senior part members from uh, LeftRack spun out and created PTM in 2018. And the fundamental thesis was to develop what we call accessible multifamily product within these opportunity zones um, at price points that the surrounding demographic could attain. And the fundamental difference between what we do and what we saw a lot of other opportunity zone players doing was early on, there was really only two camps of OZ players. And that hasn't changed much. You either have your developers who are doing a single project and they're raising capital for one project, or you have allocators who are raising large pools of capital, and then they're allocating to those individual developers. And what happens, those allocating allocated funds are great in the sense that they provide diversification for the port for the investor, but they also have multiple layers of fees, right? You have the fees that the developer charges, then you have the fees that the fund allocator charges. And if they're on one of the large retail distribution platforms, whether it's you know one of the big investment banks or RIAs, et cetera, there's another layer of fees on top of those, yeah. right? So what we realized very early on was that we could, leveraging our background in development and my background on the private equity side, we could raise a discretionary vehicle where we are either the sole sponsor or the co-GP development sponsor on a handful of opportunity zone developments. And amazing to say that only six years ago, pre-AI, um, but uh, we we came up with our own kind of screening uh, methodology, which AI has made us a lot more efficient at, but um, a screening methodology using GICS data, right, to evaluate the various um, opportunity zones to understand where we thought um, growth was going to be naturally occurring or heading, right, so that we can still work within these low-income housing tracks as designated by HUD, right? But um, take out a little bit of the risk that would be associated with just picking a random OZ tract and a random piece of land within there, right? So there was a really clear methodology as to how we identified the geographic areas within the OZs. And then from there, we price 
our product to make sure that at least 65% of the existing residential base within one mile can afford to rent within our buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that they would be able to handle the rent at a less than 30% of gross income per, per year number. Interesting. Yeah, so I was that was a lot. Shocked. Yeah, no, that's a lot. And I, and, you know, I, one, some of your projects are here uh, in my backyard in, in downtown St. Petersburg, Florida, which is a, a thriving downtown area. And I was I was actually shocked to see the projects there being that I, I didn't assume that where you had those projects being developed, that that would have been an opportunity zone. I just didn't. I mean, there's already lots of activity, lots of lots of activity that's occurred over the past decade. Um, there in that downtown St. Pete area. So I was just curious and, and, you know, more intrigued than anything else to see that that was an opportunity zone. So in right in my backyard, those projects down there, do you guys, do you guys, um, uh, as far as making them, you know, affordable and accessible to, you know, 65% of, of the population within a one, one mile radius, how does that, how does that compare, I guess, uh, when you look at other competitors in the immediate marketplace that have similar product of yours? I mean, are you, do you guys also try to stay, you know, $3 a foot less, $5 a foot less, or a percentage less than that of the other competitors? So what, what I realize now, and, and it's all the more important given what we've gone through with uh, the pandemic, supply chain disruption, um, and, and these price increases on materials and inflation is that our methodology when it comes to design and pre-development and pricing is, is not what I thought was commonplace. It's not as commonplace as, as, as I thought it was, right? And when I say that, what do I mean? <clears throat> we are extraordinarily detail-focused on our, on our products, Right. And while we have a very clear, I'll call recipe as to our typical unit size, the typical types of amenities within the units and, and, and finishes, we do customize those to the individual market, right? And from there, we work hand in hand with the GCs and the subcontractors. And if we are not seeing the pricing that we think we can obtain, will go and buy the project product direct, right? A lot of times cutting out the middleman, mm -hmm. right? Um, where we see the biggest uh, cost savings over the past several years is on our structure, right? Where we get very involved in the rebar and the concrete. We do our own takeoffs internally. And in all candor, that has saved us millions of dollars over the past several years on our various projects. And I think it's not that we're special, right? I think it's just that given our backgrounds, given where we come from, my partner, Nick Pantuliano, is, a, is an engineer by trade. We have our head of construction is a 40-year veteran. This is from the GC side. He knows this business inside and out. We pull these things apart so that we understand the cost down to the screw. Mm -hmm. And when you manage it at that level of granularity, you have a lot more control over you know all the unforeseens because the only thing I know with certainty in our business is that whatever we put on the Excel is wrong. <laughs> That's right. It's all Every I know. Time. Every time, right? Every time. <laughs> no. That's so right. it's it's about really being hands on, and you 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 have to be there, right? You have to be there. So for every one of our projects, we have folks on the ground. We have a, a gentleman who now is a full time St. Pete resident. Um, who I'm very jealous of, actually, because I love it there. And um, same thing down here and same thing up in D.C. Uh, you have to be there. You have to be on site. You have to be a part of the team. And I feel that a lot of folks, going back to what you know, Mr. Lefrak used to say about anyone can call themselves a developer, you know, a lot of folks outsource some of these pieces, right? Whether it's to the JLLs or the CBREs, you can't. You're, you're not aligned. It's all about, you know, being there. Well, I think, you know, to, to my next question is, you know, just, um, you know, being how granular in nature you guys uh, handle each one of these respective projects. I mean, is, is there a certain limitation you put as far as, because you know, I think from like a scalability perspective, right? Like that obviously it creates limitations as far as available resources internally of, of taking on maybe, you know, five projects versus maybe two at a time, whatever that number might look like. But do you guys have 
in, interior or set parameters in place to say, hey, like we're literally just going to focus on these projects, these two projects until they get to whatever stage, 80 percent before we even consider bringing on something else. Um, do you find those limitations are, are, are in place because of how how involved you are or does that not does one not correlate with the other? No, it's a great question. And it's one we talk about internally quite a bit. Um, and I think when the market was going like this between, you know, 2021, 2022, early 23, there was a lot of opportunities that we wanted to do. We couldn't do. We just did not have the bandwidth, right? Because what we try to do is we try to set our schedule up so that as a project moves, because a lot of people don't realize how much time goes into a development project before they even see a shovel in the ground, mm -hmm. Right. So, and especially given COVID, a lot of those administrative processes for approvals and, and site plans, et cetera, have been completely upended, right? Miami, for example, used to be a, an, a 12 to 18 month process. It's now 24 to 30 months. Um, and that's tough, right? But <clears throat> what we try to do is we try to have our projects staged in a way where as project is rolling out of pre-development into the start of vertical, the next, the, the project that was already in vertical is kind of wrapping off, wrapping up and tailing off. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new one in, right? So it's this kind of continuous um, flow of projects. But I will say that had we not had this kind of, um, you know, detailed hands-on process, I don't think that we would be having this conversation about, you know, all the good stuff we're, we're working on right now. And instead we'd be talking about all the fires we're trying to put out. That's right. That's right. That's a very valid point. Um, I'd say very, very akin to that of, of, of probably how we've, we've uh, run our company over the last couple of years. I was, I was around during the GFC and, and dealt with some of the, the blowback and the shrapnel from that and took a number of years to, to, uh, to recover and and ultimately, you know, when when capital was being thrown at us, projects being thrown at us, um, you know, in the last you know twenty twenty late 2020, 2021, 2022, we were we were not competitive buyers. You know, it just was very difficult um, to make things pencil and, and underwrite. And you know, there's that there's that 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 sense of missing out, right? Like you know that 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 FOMO that that definitely creeps into everybody because you see everyone else doing deals, everyone's transacting. And what we found ourselves as we found ourselves more of net sellers of, of, of certain projects, you're yeah. trying to, you know, clean out the portfolio of, of maybe things that we didn't see the, you know, longevity in, whether it be the marketplace or the asset, we've kind of maximized the value and the price that's being offered. It's just, I can't, I understand this asset better than anyone else. And I don't understand how they're getting to these economics. And so <laughs> let's, let's, let's exit. And, and it's put us, you know, long story short, it's put us in a really good position where last year was one of our best years ever. When others were pencils down, we were in a really good place. Um, low risk debt across the board, low leverage, and um, no no floating rates, no 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 you know, terms coming due. And nothing that that's created a fire drill internally when it put us in a really good state. And so anyway, you know, the discipline, it sounds like you guys have that same discipline that's and it's now, now you get to really enjoy the, the, the fruits of uh, not necessarily the labor, but just the, again, the discipline that you guys have had over those, those prior years when you know, the real estate market was just going haywire. So no, kudos to you. That's fantastic. So what, I guess, you know, to that point, what are, are you seeing, are there any uh, additional opportunities, maybe not today, but that you guys foresee coming down the pike from <laughs> these other folks that are putting fires out, distressed opportunities, you know, term debt, you know, forcing some, you know, a developer or, or, or owner to exit out of an asset. Maybe it's not even fully baked, but I mean, is there opportunity that you see in the horizon? So firstly, I love talking to someone else who, who had the same mindset as us. So congratulations to you. <laughs> okay. um, do I see opportunities on the horizon? Yes, right. We've been saying this since um, you know we sold an asset similar to you. We sold an asset back in uh, the second half of twenty two at a price that was phenomenal, and the directive to the acquisitions team was put your pencils down, right? Let's step back, let's reevaluate where we are in the cycle, and let's. The conclusion was let's begin preparing for the other side of the cycle now. Um, there's no doubt you're starting to see the cracks happen. Right. And the rise in interest rates 
affects everyone in real estate, right? Debt is a fundamental component. The value of our assets are tied to the yield curve. Um, what, what I think is interesting is there's been, and, and we saw this with retail about 10 to 12 years ago, right? There was a secular shift in retail then, right? Where everyone said, oh, retail's dead. Everything's online. Well, fast forward 10, 15 years, we know that's not entirely true, right? Um, but retail has changed, right? Well, now that's the mindset around office. Office is dead. No one's ever going back. Da, 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 da. That's not true, right? Office is going to change. It is a secular change. Multifamily, right, is, is, is unique. It's different because what we saw over COVID was, yes, you can survive shopping online. You can survive working at home, but you still need a place to lay your head in bed, right? And that model, while the amenities may change, while the needs of the client may change, the need to have a place to live won't change, right? So I think what we're seeing in multifamily is much more of a, a uh, market-driven event, right? That's impacted by, you have nearly $650 billion worth of multifamily debt coming due in the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. Right. And that doesn't include all the debt where interest rate caps are expiring. Yeah. Right. So you have all these folks who bought deals aggressively or even un not aggressively, mm -hmm. right. But borrowed at a price that's not re repeatable, replicable today. Their asset might be as a result of where interest rates are, might be worth less than it was when they bought it. And they're going to be forced to refinance into a market where they're either going to need to raise more equity and put more equity into the deal or give the keys back. Mm -hmm. Right. So I really think that this is kind of a, unlike the GFC, which was a, you know, spurred by an event, right. I think this is very different. This is a bit of a slow moving, you know, um, malaise that's going to make its way mm -hmm. through the market. Um, and it'll provide, you know, it'll create a lot of pain, but it'll create a lot of opportunity to clean out um, a lot of what's been there. So am I seeing it yet in bits and pieces, drips and drabs? I think the bid-esque spread between distressed seller and capitalized buyer remains wide, yeah. um, especially as banks are you know, still reticent to really take write-downs. But that too will change. So what have you guys done internally, I guess, to, to, to prepare, um, you know, when, when that time comes, when that time arises, I mean, have there any pivotal structural changes that you've made uh, on the acquisition side uh, to, to just put yourself in the best light? Sure. So from a, from a PTM standpoint, PTM is strictly limited to the opportunities, right? So what we're seeing there is you know we've kind of changed our investment structure to we're not solely doing gp investment and sponsorship but there are development deals now where existing sponsors find themselves to have a gap in their capital stack mm -hmm. right whether it's a result of cost moving or interest reserves right needing to be filled right so there's some interesting ways for us to play in that era we're starting to see um more uh, sponsors being open to the concept of a long-term pref equity structure with some back-end participation, right? That was something that we tried day one in the OZ and we were told absolutely not, right? But nowadays, a yeah. bit, more, bit more of a discussion. Curious that like in that scenario, like when you guys step in uh, on a pref equity um, front and, you know, you guys are you guys are very hands-on again, very uh, uh, involved in the project, probably more so than a lot of other of your, your typical developers. And so in that arrangement, a prep equity arrangement, how do you guys, you know, do you gain a level of comfort of not necessarily having your finger on the entirety of the pulse, right? Not, not you, because you, I mean, maybe, maybe it's how the operating agreement's written, right? Maybe you guys can still do your thing and still be very much involved, but most of the time that just wouldn't be the case. The, in these cases, you're, you're absolutely right, right? In these cases where we've looked at it um, and, and have worked through it, these are best of breed developers where we have Got it. the utmost confidence in their capability and skill set. Mm -hmm. um, and we've vetted these things to as if it was our own, right? Sure. So it's, yep. not a, it's not a very casual 
kind of passive investment. Understood. Um, but then I think the other thing that's interesting is pre-TCOs, right? For all of us in the space, pre-TCO investing I'm not, or- I'm not familiar with that. What's TCO? Sure. So the, the Opportunity Zone afforded two ways to invest, right? One was what they called substantial improvement, where you would buy a piece of land or buy an existing building and you had to double the basis of the, of the improvement. The other was you could buy a completed asset prior to its receipt of a temporary certificate of occupancy, technically prior to it being put in use, right? Um, or any depreciation taken on the building, which would be a TCO. Mm -hmm. That was a very difficult um, hurdle for most people because the pricing, especially pre um, the interest rate you know, jumps, the pricing was so outrageous and aggressive because it was based on forward-looking NOI right. with zero tenants, right? And you had to not just think through getting to a price that worked, but then you had to think through, well, how are we financing this thing? Are we going to go get bridge financing for the lease-up period? How does that work? The numbers never really penciled. Well, now the numbers are starting to get a little more interesting. And when you step back and think about it, you say, okay, I could pay a little bit of premium relative to where a, you know, an asset might trade um, otherwise today, but I don't have to take the development risk. Mm -hmm. I cut out two years of waiting time and we're cash flowing that much sooner. Well, maybe buying something at a six is today's in today's world isn't so bad if I'm only able to build to a seven. Yeah. Um, so pre TCO transactions are definitely on the rise. And you also have a lot of, OZ developers who, you know, they, they need, they have the asset might be fine, but they also have other issues in their portfolio. They may need the liquidity here to put it out over there. Yeah. Very interesting. No, that's great. I appreciate you sharing. And I want to make sure that we're, we're you know, we're, we're coming up on time now. And I, I want to, um, a couple more things I want to run through before we wrap it up here. I guess one more specifically is just a better understanding, um, you know, kind of your, you know, the, the units that you guys build, you're getting, you provide luxury housing that has hotel quality amenities. Um, you know, I think efficiently size is another, you know, another uh, uh, bullet point I've kind of highlighted here. Just what does that mean? I guess it gives us a better understanding of what your specific projects look like. You guys put a lot of thought and energy into the overall design element of it, but what, if one has to you know, kind of paint their own picture that's listening to this, what, what are they going to get by coming to one of your, your developments? Sure. So <clears throat> I'll start with the easy. Myself and my two partners all were, you know, big parts of, of putting together the one hotel South Beach, right? So that design element, right, of, you know, very natural color palettes, right, organic living, health and wellness and sustainability and light are fundamental components of all of our products, right? And light is arguably the most powerful piece that anyone can put into a building, right? Whether it's natural or artificial, we prefer natural, but... When we talk about efficient unit sizes, we're not talking about micro units, right? What we're talking about is, is creating a, a one bedroom at 600 square feet, which has everything you need and nothing you don't, right? But the most important thing it has is floor to ceiling windows, right? Or as big a window as we possibly could fit in there um, because that light makes everything feel better, right? And from there, right? Look, in, in this day and age, a lot of these, a lot of renters don't even use their kitchen. Um, but we we make sure that, you know, one of the fundamental things coming from New York, growing up in New York, is that people have built-in storage, right? So in Florida, jacket closets are not normal, right? But we'll have a lot of extra millwork in the units, whether it's in the bathrooms or in the kitchens or in the living area that allows for that storage space, right? So 600 square feet with built-ins feels, and a lot of natural light feels very big. And <clears throat> what we do know, because I always say developers are two things. We're historians and we're sociologists, <laughs> right? We study a lot about people. Yeah. And what we're learning more and more is our, our renter profile, they love their units. They love you know the views, the light, but they really love being out and about in the common areas with everybody else. So we oversize our, our spaces, right? We're doing a new building in Miami called 1900 Biscayne in Edgewater. 
we're going to have almost 60,000 square feet of amenity space, right? That's wow. an acre and a half almost. Yeah. Wow. Um, all elevated, looking at the water, um, where we'll have, you know, everyone has a pool, right? Everyone has, uh, you know, these kind of communal kitchens. Everyone has the co-work. And I think, you know, there's programming to how the co-work should um, operate. It shouldn't just be a table thrown in the lobby. Um, but, you know, golf simulators are, you know, I think people got really excited about, but they're realizing that's a lot of maintenance. Um, but immersive activity, right? Where people aren't just sitting on chairs all by themselves with their headphones on doing work, but where they're actually engaging, right? So we're looking at doing a, a sports lounge, right? Where we will use a projector screen for the whole wall to feel like you are actually on the field, you know, using an Oculus almost as like you're on, you know, and, and by doing that, right, it's not a major investment. And you have people now who ordinarily wouldn't have spoken to one another, but they both happen to be Real Madrid fans. Yeah. And so they we're having an event and they're watching the game. They feel like they're right on the sidelines. And next thing you know, they're talking. And what we do know for fact is you make one friend in your building, you're about 75% more likely to sign a new lease next year. Hmm. You make two friends, that gets up to about 90%. And three friends, you're up in that, you know, um, high 98 99% likelihood that, oh, that you're that's signing great up again. Intel. Yeah, no, I, I never thought of that. Yeah, that's great. How, so about, for us, it's about bringing about hospitality. So like, you know, like what is the, the you know, identifying the, these new perspective amenities and like, you know, is it just the, is it the nice to have the latest and greatest? I mean, or do you actually survey? I mean, are there, are there thorough surveys done to determine like folks, they actually want this and they feel as though they're actually going to use it as well? Or, or is it just a, a good bit of guesswork, you know, to find out what people really, really want? So, so many developers complain that they spend all this money on the amenities and they have no utilization. Um, we spend, the favorite part of my job is diligencing this point exactly, okay. right? So we spend a lot of time observing how the spaces are used. And we also spend a lot of time understanding what the different kinds of amenities are that folks are offering in different markets and even in different countries, Right. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's at all scales. So we have a firm belief that multifamily residential and extended stay hospitality, they're really the same exact thing. It's just a term of the lease that differs. Right. So if you, if you exist in that mindset, you can then say, well, what does a five-star resort have amenity wise that people really tend to like and use? And that information is readily available because they market it like crazy. And you know what gets used and what doesn't, because if it doesn't get used, it's out, right? Well, so, right. and that's yeah. just talking to hotel GMs. And and so we take a lot of those things and, and try to incorporate that. I'll give you a funny example. <clears throat> there was a moment in time where people were really excited about these life-size chess boards outside right um you know they're cool looking they look cool. right and, yeah and, they do and, look cool yeah <laughs> I, I can't say i've ever Who uses I like, that? And, I, and i actually like chess but i can't say i've ever actually used one i think i probably have yelled no. at my kids for knocking them over for at a resort or something like that you know not using it for what they're intended to <laughs> especially funny. when you're in florida and it's 95 degrees and That's humid right. out who wants to stand around and move these things around for an hour and a half right so, but that takes up so much real estate, right? Um, that you can otherwise program to do really cool things. So this is now a couple of years ago, but we took that space and you know we did all sorts of 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 great stuff. The the coolest being we started doing again from a cruise ship I'd gone on, movie events where everyone wore the the headphones, right? So you had like a, a movie playing in virtual surround sound but you couldn't hear it unless you had the headphones on. Right. And like a, like a we then said, well, if, <laughs> and bingo. So we said, if we could yeah. do this, why can't we do the silent disco? Will people really come? And guess what? It was a 350 unit building. We had about 600 residents. There were 380 people there. Get out of here. And wow. what a, what a that to us was, Damn. so it's, it's studying those kinds of things and, and having the right kind of property manager who. Who, who understands that 
it's not just about rent collection and, you know, leases, but it's about the experience, right? It's all experiential. And that I think is, you know, to really answer your question the right way, what makes our product unique? It's experiential. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I appreciate you sharing that, Michael. That's great. Now, uh, you know, we, we definitely went a little bit deeper there than what I thought. And that's fantastic. It really helps us better understand exactly what it is you guys are doing. Again, what what really is your unique selling proposition? What sets you guys apart from from the competition? I think you nailed it. So I uh, appreciate that. And, you know, I guess for those you, know, as we wrap things up here, for those that are tuning in here that want to learn more about, um, you and PTM and the different projects you guys have working. And, and I guess the, the, the other part of that question would be as far as uh, from an investment perspective, are your, are your developments or your deals open uh, to accredited investors? I mean, do you take retail capital in or we didn't go down that path as far as, you know, what your capitalization sources are, but um, feel free to share if, uh, if you're open to accredited investors. Yeah, sure. We're absolutely open to accredited investors. Um, we're currently raising capital for two individual projects, right? One of which is in Miami called 1900 Biscayne. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think I have to be careful about how much we say there, but you yeah, know, we're much. certainly open to accredited investors and, and talking to them about the various projects we're working on. Yeah, I think simply and, enough. I mean, for those that want to reach, I guess, what's the best place to to get in contact with you and, and learn more about these various projects or, you know, whatever you guys have going on? Our website is www.ptmpartners.com. And on that site, you'll see a uh, ability to reach out and inquire. And those emails go right to me and our office manager. So we will be quick to respond. Fantastic. Well, Michael, it's been a pleasure having you. I appreciate you coming on and wishing you guys all the best. And uh, again, appreciate you sharing all the details about PTM and your background. And it's been a fun conversation, my friend. Thank you for having me. I look forward to doing it again and seeing you in St. Pete. All right, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bob, wishing you huge success. Take care now.